Back in 1934, the Red Hook section of Brooklyn, New York, was home to a thriving port and a shipbuilding industry. At least 10,000 people worked in that area back then. And back then there were 40 bars. One remained until just a few weeks ago. Antonio Sonny Balzano was the proprietor. It was simply called Bar. One day the writer Tim Sultan was driving home one night. He missed his exit and he found himself in that dark and desolate section of Brooklyn. The only light that he saw was a sign that was dimly lit bar. This is when he met Sonny. And after many years of his knowing Sonny, he wrote a remarkable memoir called Sonny's Nights. He described Sonny as a vanishing breed of barstool storyteller. He was the bard of Red Hook, a Brooklyn original, an artist, a natural poet who spoke in metaphors, a, a gifted storyteller, a philosopher, telling a dirty joke at one moment and reciting a scene from Beckett at the next. And the visitors to his bar were his audience. He was also a therapist. He knew just what to say to calm an angry person, to diffuse an argument or pacify a violent drunk. Sultan tells us that when you entered Sonny's bar, you left your occupation at the door. No one cared what you did, who you were, where you came from. People related to each other as people, not as titles or accomplishments. Sonny was a true character, with many well-known flaws and sins. And yet in the midst of such flagrant weaknesses, he became a legend in that rundown area of Brooklyn. He died a few weeks ago, and Tim Sultan stated he had a heart of gold. And he said at his funeral, I am a much better person because I knew him. He never tried to impress people, put on any airs. He accepted people as they were, and when they left his bar, they were better when the, than when they came in. Wouldn't that be great if people said about us what Tim Sultan wrote about Sonny? I am a better person because I knew him or her. And it's so interesting because Sonny Balzano was certainly no Mother Teresa. He was far from it. In our second reading this weekend, Paul and Barnabas are called by God to be a light to the Gentiles, to be an instrument of salvation. If you remember correctly, in our scriptures, Paul was no Mother Teresa either. He was quite the sinner before he converted. So we are all called to be some kind of light in this world, to be some kind of instrument of salvation for one another. Even when we're weighed down in past sins and weaknesses, the great apostle Paul was the murderer before he became the great saint. Sonny Balzano was neither a good husband or a good father. Yet how interesting God called them both and used them both to bring light into this world. In our culture today, so many people find their worth in being successful, being famous, winning, having prestige, being on top. And when that ends, and sometimes even before it ends, in the midst of it, there's often a feeling of despair, of being worthless, of not really having any purpose in life. For nearly a decade, Tiger Woods was the dominant force in pro golf, spending 264 weeks as number one in the world. But as we all know, after a rash of injuries and poor performances, Woods experienced a significant drop in his ranking. It was just this past December, 2015, 
that The Week magazine reported that Woods was struggling. Struggling to find his identity after some back surgery, his third back surgery. And this is what he told reporters. He said, there is really nothing I can look forward to. I am really good at playing video games. That's basically how I pass a lot of my time. Then there's comedian Jim Carrey, who expressed this obsession with winning so well at this year's Golden Globe ceremony. Before announcing the nominees for Best Motion Picture for Comedy, he said this to the Hollywood elite gathered before him. He said, I am a two-time Golden Globe winner, Jim Carrey. You know, when I go to sleep at night, I'm not just a guy going to sleep. I'm two-time Golden Globe winner, Jim Carrey, going to get some well-needed shut-eye. And when I dream, I don't just dream any old dream. No, sir. I dream about being three-time Golden Globe winning actor Jim Carrey because then I would be enough. It would finally be true and I could stop this terrible search for what I know ultimately won't fulfill me. Well, the actors who were present, all of them dressed to perfection in designer gowns and tuxedos, well, they doubled over in laughter but then the camera panned their faces, and it seemed that his words rang truer than any of Hollywood or we are comfortable admitting. If a Golden Globe or three will not satisfy us, then what will? I'm sure Tiger Woods has so much more to offer than just his ability at golf. Jim Carrey, in a humorous way, challenges our terrible search for what will ultimately fulfill us. It certainly won't be winning the Masters. Jordan Spieth on Sunday realized that, or is continuing to realize that, with the tremendous disappointment of his loss. It's great to win the Masters. He did it last year. But it's not about winning that or three Golden Globes, or three Oscars. That kind of glory fades, and it fades so very fast. There was a very interesting study published recently in a clinical psychology magazine that proves that helping others and caretaking provides much more ultimate meaning than success or winning or money because it is all about being some kind of a light in this world. It is all about being some kind of an instrument for others of salvation. This past January, 2016, NPR reported on a man by the name of Mike Pojam. He is the assistant headmaster and the senior advisory for the boys of Roxbury Latin Boys School. Pojam was inspired by a program at his alma mater, St. Ignatius High School in Cleveland, which connects the seniors with those people who have died alone. So the story from NPR focused on six senior boys who volunteered to be pallbearers for a man who died alone in September and for whom no next of kin was found. He was being buried in a grave with no tombstone in a city cemetery so these six senior boys dressed in jackets and ties, they carried the plain wooden coffin, and they took part in a short memorial. They read this prayer together, six senior boys. Dear Lord, thank you for opening our hearts and minds to this corporal work of mercy. We are here to witness to, witness to the life and passing of Nicholas Miller. He died alone with no family to comfort him. But today, we are his family. We are here as his sons. We are honored to stand together before him now, to commemorate his life, and to remember him in death as we commend his soul to his eternal rest. And after the ceremony, the six boys piled back into the van, 
headed back to school to take their next class or their next test. But one of those students by the name of Brendan said this. He said, I know I'm going back to school to take another quiz and go to another class, but all of that work, you get so easily caught up in it. When you kind of get out of that bubble that you get stuck in, you get perspective on what's really important in life. So, no matter where we find ourselves at this part, point in history, whether we have failed miserably, sinned horrendously, whether we find ourselves horribly depressed over a divorce or loss of a loved one or some sickness that we're going through, no matter what, each one of us is called to be some kind of light in our small little world, to be some kind of instrument of salvation for some other person. Our ultimate meaning will not be found in our golf game or the trophies on our shelves, but perhaps it would be nice if someone at our funeral said, I'm a much better person for having known him or her.